free. I got this comment this morning, and just one single word, confusing. And it was under a video that I did called The Gospel of the Damned. And basically, it was a video on once saved, always saved. And I thought to myself, well, wonder why they're saying it's confusing. And when I thought about my own experience of going to church for 20 years, very confused through those 20 years of what the gospel was. And when I look back now, hindsight is 2020, I realized they were not clarifying the gospel. And I went to a handful of churches throughout that time. So it wasn't just like one church I was at. I went to several churches. If I count them out, probably about five or six, plus hearing a lot of sermons on the radio, on TV. And yet now when I think back, there was a lot of time wasted in the sense that I never heard the gospel and they sowed a lot of fear and they sowed a lot of implications that led to a false gospel that would lead to a mentality by which one would be tried to be justified by their performance to the law. So when I saw this come and I thought, well, maybe that's what this person experiencing. They're experiencing some confusion about the gospel because when you understand the gospel and you see th things through the lens of the gospel and how according to the gospel we're made righteous, the confusion disappears. So Tommy Girl, I hope this video helps you. Because in this video, I'm going to show you how the Bible tells us that we are made righteous before God, according to the gospel. Because Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So Paul said in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, which is a key element. We need to know how we are made righteous in the sight of God because the scripture declares that in and of our own standing, there's none righteous, no, not even one. In the New and Old Testament, it says that in and of our own standing before the eyes of God, independent from God's grace, there's none righteous, no, not even one. Jesus said, no one is good but God alone. So independent from God's declaration of grace on a person declaring a person to be righteous, independent from that, there's none righteous, no, not even one, and no one is good but God alone. In Ecclesiastics, it says, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does right and never sins. So this is the predicament that makes us all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and this is the predicament that has to be rectified in order for us to get into heaven. In order for us to be saved, we have to be made righteous because the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So we have to be made righteous in the sight of God. Now, since there's none righteous, no, not even one, and no one is good but God alone, Jesus says to us, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That we are to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not our own. People are seeking to establish their own righteousness, and we'll get into those scriptures in a little bit, but the Bible says that we are to seek his righteousness and not our own righteousness. Now, Jesus tells us how we are made righteous, and the gospel clearly lays out how we're made righteous in the sight of God. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So Jesus says, that if you've hungered and thirsted after righteousness, you will be filled. And then he tells us how a person is filled. He said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. That Jesus is telling us that once you recognize that no one is good but God alone, there's none righteous, no, not even one, and you want righteousness, but you don't have it, and you're hungering and thirsting for it, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In other words, you get an everlasting righteousness. That once you come to Jesus and then you believe in him, you're filled and you shall never hunger and thirst again. You have a righteousness that's forever. And you see this in the New Testament. According to the gospel, it says, if those who receive the abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in this life through the one Christ Jesus. So it calls righteousness a gift. And then it says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. That once you get the gift of righteousness, it's irrevocable. It's 
eternal, it's everlasting, God never takes it away. Which is exactly what Jesus said concerning righteousness, that if you come to him, you shall never hunger, you shall never thirst again, you are filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So to be filled with the everlasting eternal gift of righteousness, you simply have to come and believe in Jesus Christ. Because the essential part of the gospel is that our hearts believe to righteousness in Christ. We don't work to righteousness. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the scripture says with the heart one believes to righteousness. When we come and we believe in Jesus Christ, he fills us up with that eternal righteousness. We shall never hunger and thirst again. And you don't have to work for this righteousness. Romans chapter 4 verse 5, to the one who doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So to the one who doesn't work, so you don't have to work the works of the law, because it's our hearts that believe unto righteousness. Notice it says, to the one who doesn't work, so you don't have to work, but believes on him, that's Jesus, who justifies the ungodly, that's a non-guilty verdict, his faith is accredited to righteousness. So God makes us not guilty in his sight by our faith, and then he makes us righteous, which means he makes us heaven ready, which means he's the savior. If we need to be righteous to get into heaven, and that's what saves us, then he's the savior by giving us his righteousness. That's why 2 Corinthians says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus never committed any sin at all, but he became sin for us, according to the scripture. That he was tempted in all ways, in all points, yet without sin. And just as Jesus never committed any sin and became sin for us, we never did any righteous actions to become righteous. It was a divine transaction that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the glorious thing about the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done is he has made millions and millions of people collectively and equally righteous by faith in him, which saves them, which makes him the savior by impart, imparting his righteousness upon them that saves them. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe and there is no difference that we're collectively and equally made righteous by our faith in Christ Jesus. And when it comes to becoming righteous or being made righteous, your obedience will add zero merit to your righteousness. That you don't merit righteousness through your obedience, that we have righteousness through Christ's obedience. The scripture says, just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners even so through the one man's obedience the many are made righteous so it's through the one man's obedience that the many are collectively and equally made righteous even the righteousness of god which is by faith in christ jesus upon all and unto all who believe and there is no difference so our obedience doesn't earn righteousness nor does it merit righteousness we get righteousness on the basis of faith according to the gospel now, there's plenty of people trying to merit and earn their own righteousness. They're trying to establish and earn their own righteousness through their own obedience. And Paul said about them, I testify about them, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So Paul says that those who are ignorant of God's righteousness are seeking to establish their own righteousness. They would be doing that through means of the law and their own obedience, trying to establish their own righteousness. But in doing so, the Bible says they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, you get his righteousness and the law has come to its end. In terms of you trying to earn or merit or or get righteousness through your obedience to the law the law has come to its end christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes because remember when you believe in jesus christ according to jesus himself he fills you up 
with his righteousness to where you never hunger and thirst again. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. See, the reason why some people are still hungering and thirsting after righteousness and still trying to establish their own righteousness and do not feel filled is because they don't believe what Jesus said. And they don't believe what he accomplished concerning the gospel. And so being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're seeking to establish their own righteousness. And in doing so, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the law has come to its end in terms of trying to be made righteous under it. That's why Paul said, may I be found in him having a righteousness, not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So Paul said, may I be found in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own. People who are seeking to establish their own righteousness through their own obedience, trying to merit righteousness. They're seeking a righteousness of their own through the law. Paul said the very opposite for us who believe. That we would be found in him having a righteousness not of our own, which comes through the law. That is, we're not looking to the law, to our own performance and obedience to be made right and righteous in the sight of God. We look to Jesus. May I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So why many people are diligently seeking righteousness in and themselves, they're trying to find righteousness in themselves through their life, they will never find it in themselves. It's found in Christ, where 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, By his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. That we have a positional righteousness in Christ and it's sanctification and redemption that if anyone would boast that they have these things that they would boast in the Lord and not in self. People that are ultimately seeking their own righteousness are ultimately seeking their own boasting in themselves and not in the Lord. But our boast is in the Lord that he has made us righteous positionally in him on the basis of faith that he did all the work that was necessary and that we're saved by his work, not our own. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, he saved us. And according to scripture, he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So he saved us and he called us with a holy calling. So he already saved us and he called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works. So we're not made holy because of our own works, but because of purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So it's purposes of grace by which we're made holy, not because of our own works. Paul said, if it's of grace, it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So we don't have to work to be made holy. Christ did all the work. Colossians says he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That we're holy in God's sight without blemish, free from accusation, righteous in his sight. And that's why the scripture says, by this love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, that as he is, so we are in this world. That as he is, so we are in this world. We're holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation, righteous. And that's why we'll have confidence on the day of judgment. That's why 1 John says, these things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, not think or hope or wish it's a possibility, but these things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, because in the believing, God gives us his righteousness on the basis of faith. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe, and there is no difference. So when I read this comment, this one single word that says confusing, you know, it brought to mind the gospel that I, you know, have come acquainted with that took a very long time and it wasn't through the church system. And I had years and years of personal confusion when it come, came to the clarification of the gospel because none of the authoritative figures that I was looking to that should have been presenting it, uh, they weren't presenting it. 
So it took a lot of study from the scriptures and God brought uh, certain individuals into my life with particular considerations concerning the functionality of the law and righteousness. And those things helped me to understand what I know today that has cleared up the confusion. And so, Tommy girl, I hope that you've watched this video and I hope this does clear up some confusion for you. That you'll come to learn and understand that Jesus Christ isn't holding righteousness out at the end of a carrot stick and having you run on a treadmill for you to try to get some nourishment, for you to get filled. He's not holding righteousness at the end of a carrot stick so that you run a, on a treadmill so that you're trying to get right with him. He makes us right with him the moment that we come to him. That's why he says to us, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. They shall not come into the judgment that have passed from death to life. The one who believes has, not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has everlasting life. They shall not come into the judgment and they have passed from death to life. So I hope you come to understand the clarification of the gospel and, and the peace that God provides through his son that's perfect and everlasting to the knowledge of the righteousness that he gives us. As a perfect everlasting gift that he fills us up with the moment that we come to him. We don't have to work for it. It's not through our own obedience. We don't have to establish it. We collectively and equally share it. So I hope you come and share that gift of righteousness with us if you haven't already. Maybe you have it already and don't even know it. A lot of people, including myself, had the gift of righteousness, the inheritance of Christ, but it wasn't disclosed to me what that inheritance is. And that happens with a lot of people. They can have an inheritance out there. They don't even know what it is. No one's disclosed to them what they actually have. And so to really find out the inheritance, I had to go to the scriptures where the Bible says, Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. That we have been blessed with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. That includes righteousness. That we've received the full inheritance of God. That he that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely with him give us all things? That we've been given the full inheritance of God by his grace through Jesus Christ. So God bless guys, peace to you and take care. I hope your night or day is going good. There have been people with beautiful faces, many memories and wonderful places, but my Lord Jesus, you never let me down. Through the years and Sisters and brothers, yeah. when the seasons have turned.